In this chapter, I ask how much of the cross-country income differences that we observe can be explained with the help of the solo model. We've seen in the chapters on the solo model that it can explain some stylized facts quite well from a qualitative perspective. So it can explain why countries grow in the long run, driven by technological progress, and why this rate of growth is comparatively similar across the rich countries. We have seen that the solo model can explain the convergence after the Second World War of Germany back towards its uh, balanced growth path, which back then in the 1950s could not be explained and was called the economic miracle. But actually the solo model explains it very well. And we've also seen that the solo model can explain cross-country income differences by differences in parameter values, for example, the saving rate. And now in this chapter, we ask how well the solo model explains cross-country income differences from a quantitative point of view. So where we really put numbers on the parameters and look how much of the cross-country income differences can be explained by observed differences in the saving rate S. For this, recall what the solo model predicts. So here you see the graph of the solo model with capital per worker on the horizontal axis and output per worker on the vertical axis. You have the curve that describes output and income per worker, this line here. You have the gross investment curve, that's the saving rate multiplied by the total income. And you have the depreciation line from the origin that intersects with the gross investment curve somewhere in the interior of the graph because it has a slope that is constant, whereas the gross investment curve has a slope that decreases due to the concavity of the production function. Now we know that there is a steady state in this case where the two curves intersect and capital accumulation stops. Now we've also seen in the chapter on the solo model that if there is a second country with a higher saving rate, then this country will have a higher steady state capital stock, here K prime star, and therefore also a higher per capita GDP if we look at the per capita GDP that these two capital stocks imply. So if we compare the two countries and they are similar, irrespect, uh, in, except for the uh, saving rate, and one country has a higher saving rate as prime, then the country with the higher saving rate as prime will have a higher per capita income according to the solo model. Now we perform this quantification and ask how much of the cross-country income differences we observe can be explained by differences in the saving rates. And for that, we start with a Cobb Douglas production function of the following form. We have that output and income of a country are determined by physical capital with an output elasticity of alpha, labor with an output elasticity of one minus alpha. And we have productivity A that is now not labor augmenting, but it multiplies the whole production function. So it's Higgs neutral here. The reason for that is that it is then easier to make these cross country comparisons when in later chapters we assume also differences in uh, technology. Here it's important that we can compute per capita income by dividing by uh, the population size or the size of the workforce, which is the same here in this model. And then we get uh, per capita output and per capita income as productivity multiplied by capital per worker to the power of alpha, so the capital intensity to the power of alpha. Now to generate kind of a, an experimental setting, we let all the parameters be the same and we say set um, population growth and technological progress equal to zero. And for that, we have the following fundamental equation of the solo model that we had already in the solo model without technological progress and without population growth. So for this case, where capital per worker changes according to gross investment, which is output multiplied by the saving rate in per capita terms, minus depreciation. If gross investment is higher than depreciation, K dot is positive and capital accumulates. And if gross investment is smaller than depreciation, then K dot is negative and capital per worker decumulates. For this case, we can then derive the steady state capital stock per worker, the capital stock at which K dot is equal to zero. So we set this equation equal to zero, which means that gross investment is equal to depreciation. So this line here at the steady state K star. 
Then we reformulate and bring capital to the left-hand side, basically. So for the first step uh, in doing this is dividing by S times A and uh, dividing by K star here on the left-hand side, which leads to K star to the power of alpha minus 1, because this division by K star reduces the exponent here by 1. Then we bring the exponent to the right-hand side, that is, we raise the right-hand side to the power of 1 over alpha minus 1. Then we only have the capital stock per worker on the left-hand side. Now this is not so nice yet, because we have an exponent that is negative actually, because alpha is smaller than 1. But we can easily change this in uh, that we multiply the exponent by minus 1 and switch numerator and denominator in the base because these two operations exactly offset each other. But in this case, then we have a positive exponent that we can more easily interpret, actually, uh, the expression for the capital stock per worker at the steady state. And we see then immediately that it depends positively on the saving rate, positively also on productivity, and negatively on the rate of depreciation, which is all kind of intuitive. So if there is a higher saving rate, more is invested in the economy, so steady state capital stock would be higher. If productivity is higher, income is higher, that also can lead to higher savings. And if the rate of depreciation is higher, then of course machines wear out uh, faster, and that would lead Ceteris Paribus to a lower capital stock per worker at the steady state. Then we can compute per capita income or per capita output with the expression that we had previously, that it is equal to A times capital per worker to the power of alpha. And we just plug in the expression that we've derived earlier for the steady state capital stock per worker. So we plug this in here. We see that this expression is raised to the power of alpha because of this alpha here. So we have alpha divided by 1 minus alpha in the exponent. And we have that this whole term multiplies by productivity. Now we can simplify this because we have here productivity outside of the parentheses and inside the parentheses. So we put this term inside the parentheses out, which then has an exponent of alpha divided by 1 minus alpha. And this term here has an exponent of 1. So we write this as 1 minus alpha divided by 1 minus alpha. And then you see immediately that if you multiply these two terms, actually uh, this alpha and that alpha cancels each other off. Um, and we have a to the power of 1 over 1 minus alpha here, and within parentheses just s over delta, and here the exponent is alpha over 1 minus alpha. So that's then per capita output or per capita income in such a country that we describe without population growth and without technological progress. Now we assume that there are two countries, two different countries, and in principle there could be differences across countries in terms of all the parameters, A, alpha, S, delta. Um, but what we want to do is to generate kind of an experimental setting where we keep everything else the same and just change one of these parameters, and the central parameter related to the solo model is the saving rate. So we assume that across countries productivity is the same, alpha, the elasticity of output with respect uh, to capital is the same in both countries and the rate of depreciation uh, is the same and we just assume that there are differences in the saving rate and then we compute the differences in output that are implied by observable differences in the saving rate. So in other words we isolate the influence of the saving rate as we would do it in a controlled experiment basically. And for this exercise, we would have the following. So we assume that countries 1 and 2 differ by the saving rates, where country 1 has the higher saving rate. And then we use the steady state output that we have derived on the previous slide. Uh, assume that it's, um, uh, it refers to both countries, but the two countries differ with the saving rate. So then we get this expression when we divide the two uh, per capita GDPs of the two countries. But we observe immediately that the first term here, productivity, drops out because it's the same in both countries. And we also have that the rate of depreciation drops out and we are just left with the ratio of the saving rates between country 1 and 2 and the exponent alpha over 1 minus alpha. Now we can use observable um, values for alpha and typically it's around one third because alpha is also the share of total 
income that is earned by the production factor capital in the solo model. And that can be rather easily computed across different countries. And for the United States, it was around one third until the 1980s for uh, about one century, actually. So we plug this in, and if we plug in one third here, then we get one third in the numerator, we get one, uh, one minus one third, which is two thirds in the denominator. So the whole thing is one third divided by two thirds, and that's basically um, one half, so that we have here. And then we plug in two saving rates, where we plug in a saving rate S1, for a rich country, which is typically around 0.2, so 20% of income. And uh, that's the gross saving rate. So uh, that includes basically depreciation. And for the low income country, we um, assume a saving rate of 5%, which is a typical value for a low income country. What we would then get is as the implied ratio of incomes between the rich country and the poor country for the given observed differences in the saving rates is that this term here solves for the square root of 4, which is 2. So according to the observable differences in the saving rates that we have between the rich country and the poor country, we should observe that the rich country is has a higher income by a factor of 2 than the poor country. However, in reality, the difference is often by a factor of 30 and even more. So the solo model predicts an income difference between the rich country with the high saving rate and the poor country with the low saving rate. But the gap in the two uh, per capita GDPs of these two countries that the solo model implies is by far not as high as the gap that we observe. So with this, we can conclude that the solo model predicts qualitatively the effect that we observe empirically, namely that the country with the higher saving rate will have a higher per capita income. But it fails quantitatively because the observed differences in the saving rate can by far not imply the observed differences in per capita income if we use the solo model for such a comparison. So we can then go back to the modeling cycle that we had when I talked about uh, the purpose of economic models, where we said that we start typically by a phenomenon that we want to explain, then we do the modeling, we come up with a formal model of the phenomenon that we are interested in. Then we do the analysis, either analytically, if we can solve the model analytically, or numerical analysis, if, we, if the model is so complex that we can only simulate it. We get the mathematical solution of the problem we are interested in. We do the interpretation, then we have an explanation for the phenomenon we are interested in, and then we do the empirical testing. Now here we've done the empirical testing in the sense that we looked the, up the extent to which the solar model can explain cross-country income differences by the observed differences in the saving rates. So here we would then conclude that the solar model explains various aspects well from a qualitative perspective, but not from a quantitative perspective. So we would then start again with the modeling cycle and extend the model in various directions. And we will see in later chapters that if we extend the model by human capital, that it can then, with differences also in education across countries, already explain a much larger part of the observable income differences uh, that we have in the real world.